Well, it uh, is probably not the most exciting edition of the KSO show that you'll ever get, but we are here to break down, recap everything that took place yesterday in Columbia. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway and KSU underscore fan, as uh, we are making up the KSO Sunday show this year. And, you know, uh, the first two Sundays were, you know, there were questions, and I don't think we felt great about where K-State was, but we certainly didn't feel like we probably feel right now after the 30 to 27 loss to Missouri K State I mean out of the gates scored immediately you kind of thought oh okay maybe this really is going to be like last year maybe all these things we thought about K State being better than Missouri uh is going to be true but we have to be honest like there was a little bit of luck in the touchdown to Philip Brooks and then you go down and uh let Missouri score instantly and the Tigers ended up having a halftime lead but the K State defense settled in they locked in long enough to give the offense a chance, and it looked like they K State was going to take that opportunity and run with it. The only issue is they sat on twenty four to twenty for far too long. They couldn't go down and, and get the the final blow that they needed, and uh, Missouri took advantage of it. They got the game tied. Actually, Mizzou took the lead. K State went down the field, failed to score a touchdown, settled for the tying field goal, and then Missouri. Only took them a minute and a half. They got to midfield and they hit the longest field goal in SEC history with Harrison Mevis to beat the Wildcats, thirty to twenty-seven. So uh, let's start just you know where where we kind of have to here. Um, what is the the most alarming part of the loss to Missouri? And Drew, I'll let you lead it off. I think that the most alarming part of the loss is that the offense still is trying to find its legs with the offensive line. I mean. Missouri blitz, it felt like every single play. And it felt like Will Howard had to throw off his back foot a lot. Or that there would be a free rusher coming in, or he'd have to avoid a rusher. And now with Will Howard being kind of hobbled a little bit, it concerns you going forward. Because if you don't have Christian Duffy back still next week, even though he's supposed to be back in a limited capacity, it it concerns you because there were a lot of plays that Will Howard made that there was just a, a free rusher coming in and because he was still a little bit mobile, he was able to avoid the rush and then get a pass off. So next week, I just don't know what he's going to look like. And the offensive line, we're just still waiting for the gelling moment. Dan, I'll let you, uh, you toss yours in here. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd say the disappointment is uh, we thought this offense was going to be <clears throat> the strength of the team throughout this season and was probably ahead of the defense coming into the season. Um, I thought that the defense might have a few issues in this game just because of the inexperience of the secondary and and breakdowns. I think we saw that happen, but I thought the offense would pick it up and they had the opportunity to do do that in the fourth quarter. And really the fourth quarter offense was, was really bad. You, you, you have a chance to score a touchdown and get a penalty and then three other drives really go nowhere in the fourth quarter when with an opportunity to kind of put Missouri away. We got, you know, had 24-17, then had the ball 24-20. I had chances. They took the lead. We did go down and tied up. But, again, we should have, we should have the lead there because we had the ball inside the five and then had a, another dumb penalty. We had two penalties inside the 10-yard uh, line. One of them we overcame, fortunately. But it's just a lot of sloppiness on the offense, I thought, too. Not just the issues we've seen, but – the, the, it's more disappointing to see the sloppiness and then and then to see Will Howard get banged up and, and what does that mean for the future? Because um, I think that did hurt as the offense went down the stretch as well. You kind of had the gimmick of throwing Avery out there to run the ball, which wasn't a bad thing, but you lose a lot when when you take away the surprise of Will Howard really being effective running the ball. The one he, had, he slid on probably was a good move to slide, but he probably gets another 10 yards on that yeah. if he's healthy. So th- that was – there's a mix, but offense is definitely the disappointment. Yeah, I mean, the, I, and I think also what's disappointing about the offense is, you know, I saw some people saying that, you know, the the receivers necessarily haven't been good. I, I don't think they've had enough opportunities because of the struggles of the offensive line to be able to to really showcase. Because I've been impressed with the receivers this year. I mean, they, I think you're getting more out of the receivers than what I would have expected, and that's with Keegan Johnson – being out right now. I mean, Jaden Jackson has been, I think, better than anybody would have anticipated to start the year. Phillip Brooks has had, you know, has some good moments to start the season as well. RJ Garcia was good early, 
it's a weird one. We didn't see much RJ Garcia yesterday, not very many touches out of him. Um, but I, I really comes down to the line. Initially they were, the line was getting killed because they couldn't help run block. And yesterday we saw that Missouri is like, well, you're, you're weak here all around. We're just going to throw everything at you. And case they didn't have much time to throw. And then, yeah, Will Howard being hurt didn't help things. And his slide, I, even even banged up like he was, I think there was probably a little bit of room to maybe get a few more yards there. Um, and, and that certainly was one of those deals that, that maybe kind of hurt. But I, I, I don't fault him for that. And then also the, the Treshawn Ward one or later in the game, I thought I thought it was actually the right move. I mean, he was not going to go much further. And instead of taking a hit or getting it punched out from behind, it's probably just safe to go down right there. I know most people will probably see him and go, well, that's a fast guy, pretty slippery. Maybe he could have gotten through. Just don't think it was going to happen. But the offense is definitely a concern right now. And, I mean, if Will Howard can't move um, with this offensive line back there, that's going to be a struggle. I mean, think back to the Texas game last year. Cats lost it by seven. Everybody is are kind of talking immediately like, should have started Will Howard, should have played Will Howard. And the one thing I say about that is Adrian Martinez was in trouble almost every time he got the ball. And Adrian Martinez is a much more mobile player than Will Howard is. And so if Adrian Martinez was struggling with a pass rush in his face relentlessly, Will would have been in the same boat, even though Will is good back there about – getting away. And I thought even yesterday he he did enough of that at times to prolong the play. The problem was they just couldn't get it to anybody. So it's one of those deals where if he can't move and the offensive line is struggling, like K-State's in a really tough spot because you're essentially facing the Texas defensive line every single game out. And that is a concern for him. And, you know, I, at some point I keep thinking like, it's clear Avery's not going to redshirt now. If you, you play him that much in the Missouri game, I think it's pretty obvious that like that's going to be a legit thing this year, which is totally fine because I think all three of us are, are in agreement. It, that type of player and a player that is as good as Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein have talked about, there's there's no reason to think that he is going to be here for five years. Like that four years is the the, the ceiling, and that's fine. And at some point, I mean, maybe you have to just – trust it and let like a pass rip to keep some people honest because I, I mean you talk about not having the element of will howard running the ball but if you don't have the element of when avery johnson the game of a throw being a possibility i think that's probably a little concerning too so i just think there's a lot going on with this offense right now that's uh that's a mildly concerning and one of the things that i would also throw out there is will howard did make some plays yesterday that would have prolonged the drive, got him a first down late, and he had guys that should be relied upon drop balls on him. I mean, the drop Ben Sennett had, that's a tough one. I mean, that's that's a ball that a guy of Ben Sennett's caliber should probably have. And, you know, everybody's going to have drops, and the moments they come in are going to, to vary. So it's probably just a, a bad moment for Ben Sennett. Uh, but, you know, despite the two touchdown grabs yesterday and some really nice plays, he did have a couple of those uh, incidents. And, you know, that's one of those things that possibly could have cost K-State in the long run. So the offense is 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 a worry. And you look at the Will Howard situation, it's going to be, I think, fascinating to monitor throughout the week because he was not moving very well during the game. And, you know, maybe maybe you're able to, to kind of get through a lot of it because UCF is, is a team without their quarterback right now. So what will they actually bring? But, you know, their offense did score yesterday against Villanova. Um, and even though it's an FCS opponent, they still did it with their backup. So uh, it'll be fascinating to see how it all unfolds this week and, and where we go from here. <laughs> Defensively, uh, what, what did you guys see yesterday? Because obviously Luther Burden killed him, and that was the one guy that you knew going into it, don't let him kill you. And Brady Cook killed you. Um, I, we, we saw, you know, one of the plays, it was a miscommunication. Things kind of broke down. Um, it seems like maybe the safeties have not been – anywhere close to what you would want or expect from them this season. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Drew take the floor first here on what he saw defensively. I mean, I think that you kind of hit on it on the head. We saw the flaws and worries that we kind of had going into the season on the, on the deep ball to Luther Burden. It was Jacob Parrish and Mark, Marcus, Marcus Siegel uh, had a miscommunication. We saw, 
players getting beat deep because of inexperience. We saw just kind of a little bit of everything, and we saw for the first time really a lack of getting to the passer. I think it was the the third quarter was probably the best pass rush quarter. But other than that, they they really struggled to get to Brady Cook last night or yesterday morning, and it really hurt them, especially when Brady Cook was also a little bit hobbled. So you thought that the third quarter and fourth quarter they'd be able to get more pressure, but it just felt like the pressure never came. And that was against just an okay offensive line that Missouri has as well. And it didn't matter if they blitzed or if they didn't blitz, the pressure just wasn't getting home. I'd say that uh, it it kind of was what I expected because I knew that uh, the quarterback run game would probably put some pressure on the secondary early, and I think that's what happened. I, but I thought Klanderman adjusted really, really well as the game went along. I mean, Missouri was really good early. They scored 17 points on their first four drives, which is not good. Had some big chunk plays. Uh, their success rate wasn't great early, it was 39%, but they were averaging nine yards per play on those first four drives. After that, K-State really settled down. Uh, Missouri had 221 yards on 41 plays after those first four drives, only a 34% success rate and down to 5.4 yards per drive and only ki- only scored uh, 13, 13 more points. So I'll take that. But uh, I really thought, you know, the, the issue you have with a young secondary is that they get their eyes wrong and you hear coaches say that all the time but what happens is they get caught looking at the quarterback when they're supposed to be in uh, when they're supposed to be in certain coverages and they don't see their key which may be an offensive tackle or it could be a guard could be running back whatever it is and if you get caught with your eyes wrong you take one false step and then a guy like Luther Burton's by you which I thought was what happened on that first touchdown and then I think it kind of happened later in the game as well. But mm-hmm. they settled down besides that last scoring drive. Uh, the biggest – but the key on that last scoring drive was we had stymied a, a pretty – pretty uh, what I think is a mediocre running game the whole game. And then they get one big play thrown on 15 yards with an unsportsmanlike face mask. Um, really the only big play they had in the running game with Cody Schrader. And then go down and score a touchdown, which which hurt at that situation. But – I wasn't – I was disappointed with the defense just because how bad they were early, but I wasn't completely surprised by that. And I really think as the game went along, the defense played well enough to win the game, and uh, the offense just couldn't take advantage of the opportunities they were given. Uh, that That's the one thing that I you – know, I think I said it on the boards last night, and, and I, I want to make note of it. Defense was not good early, and, it, you know, they they obviously deserve their their share of the blame in, in what took place yesterday. But the main thing is – Basically, midway through the second quarter until the you know mid fourth quarter, they did everything that you needed to do to win that game. They bought K State time. They bought the offense time to go out and win them the game. And the offense is supposed to be the the better side of the ball here. I mean, think about what K State lost last year. And it's okay. Yes, you lost Deuce Vaughn on offense. You lost Malik Knowles. But that's that's it. That is all that you lost from last year's team offensively. And you brought you have two very capable running backs. So even though you don't have a Deuce Vaughn, which I think they are hurt at by times because we still see it's third and seven and they're they're just gonna hand it off, try and run a draw with the running back. And it's like, okay, you could get lucky with Deuce Vaughn. Number one, DJ Giddens and Treshawn Wart a little bit bigger, easier to find for some of these guys on the field, and just not the same level of talent, even though both are very, very good. And the offensive line is not blocking as well as they had for Deuce Vaughn. And then in addition to that, like receiver, I, I, I said it earlier this week, I think receivers in a better position right now this year than they were at any point last year. Maybe you can make the argument at the very end of the season, like the receiving game peaked against TCU in the Big 12 title game because I thought Malik Knowles and Cade Warner were both really good there. But you have legitimately five pass catchers right now that I that I at least can trust and believe in if I'm K-State. And – so the defense is the, the question mark. You lost Felix and DK Uzama to the NFL draft. You lost Julius Brents to the NFL draft. You lost Josh Hayes to the NFL draft. You ended up Echo Boydo's gone because he's on the Chiefs, you know, practice squad roster. Like you lost four guys defensively that are legitimate NFL guys. And the biggest concern is three of them come in the secondary. And that's where your struggle has been. And I think one thing that probably could have keyed into us, knowing that there would be some concerns early and miscommunication is 
if you if you watch the Texas game last year, the Julius Brents gets knocked out with the you know iffy targeting call very 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 mm-hmm. early in that game, and it took the secondary a long time to finally lock in and figure it out without Julius Brents on the field. And that was even with still having a guy in Echo Boydo that had played a lot of football at K-State or Josh Hayes that had played a lot of football in his career. Now you think about the secondary, they don't have very many guys that have played a lot of football there. I, I don't know that you have a legitimate leader in the secondary right now. Like Kobe Savage is probably the guy, but you think about his situation. Yesterday was what, like his 13th game at the at the Power 5 level? You know, if you, you look at it like that. So – I just think, you know, the defense did what they needed to do. They bought time and the offense couldn't come through. And again, you know, like I hate to keep piling it on the the offensive line, but I really think all these offensive struggles really start with the offensive line and they about in there because even though Will Howard had another interception yesterday, it happens. He just, you know, guys in his face immediately needed, was trying to do something, threw it into trouble. Um, and yeah, there were a couple of key drops and maybe – Colin Klein could have been a little bit more aggressive yesterday at times. Uh, but Chris Kleiman, as we've known, is a defensive coach. And in these games, he's going to default to his defense. If K-State loses and it's clearly the offense's fault, most of the time he goes in there and the first thing he talks about is how the defense needed to be better. And he is going to default to the belief that he has in his defense. And that's what he did yesterday. It just was one too many times having to put the game in the defense's hands. And when Missouri – has a player like Luther Burden, you're going to probably get burnt a couple of times, and the more opportunities you give them to burn you, they will eventually do it. So, um, I, I, you know, that's a that's a lot of words to just kind of say what everybody knows, but I, you know, wanted to establish that there. Yeah, I, I would, I'd say that's accurate. Um, it's just tough when um, I think we. The other thing we didn't talk about yet is special teams. I thought it was pretty even. We got some mm-hmm. good returns from Brooks um, on both the punt returns and kickoff returns. I thought we punted the ball well. They didn't really even have a chance, and we got four down, I think, inside the 20-yard line. And even 10 at two of three, the one miss, he missed badly, but he did go two of three. Uh, really, the only thing Missouri had was Mivas hitting three or four. Um, even he had a miss that was mm-hmm. – was was big at the time, but then to make the the one at the end uh, after they make a mistake. Um, but you know, usually when K State wins special teams, they win games, and I thought we won special teams. And uh, to to not take advantage of that was big. And we were minus one in turnovers. I thought going in the game it'd take, it'd take minus two or three for K State to lose. Uh, but uh, I, probably the the biggest thing that I I missed was K State's offense underperforming. Well, I, you, you know, so you talk about the returns for Philip Brooks. The the one return, what he he took it out to like the, like the forty maybe, and K State didn't get points yeah. on the drive. And that's yeah. you have to take advantage of that. There were a couple of times where K State got what you know would be a, a shorter field yesterday, and they did no, nothing with it. So um, if you go and look at like some of the spots that K State started, they started uh, the second drive of the game at their own forty. That ended with the Will Howard interception on. Uh, what that was third down there. So, I mean, it is what it is on, on that play. And then you go, um, they did take advantage. They started at, the, at their own 36. They scored a touchdown, but later in the game, only got a field goal out of a drive that started at the Missouri 44. And then they had another drive that started at their own 35, ended with a punt. And the last drive that they had uh, that they started on their own 39 ended with a punt. So um, that just, they had some opportunities. Missouri gave them, some some better field position to work with, and this offense can go out and, and get it done. All right, let's dive into a, a couple of the more a bigger picture topics here now because we talked about the game. Oh, one other thing I'll throw in on special teams because some people are probably still wondering, the penalty flag that was mentioned and thrown at the end of the game when Mevis hit the game-winning field goal, um, it's, it is because there were two number eights on the field for K-State. So that penalty was going to be on K-State, and Missouri would have gotten to have tried a 56-yarder to beat them if Mevis had missed it. So it's one thing to put in the back of your head. That's a that's another giant mistake on the coaching staff. I think both coaching staffs were terrible in this game. I mean, both coaches deserve to lose this game, and, and that probably sounds harsh of Chris Kleiman, but I thought the aggressiveness was lacking in this, and you could question some mistakes. You could ask 
why did Colin Klein make some of the calls he did? And, you know, again, maybe that part of that has to do with the fact that Will Howard was banged up. But there's a lot to question there. And obviously, Elijah Drinkwitz was terrible in this game. I mean, the delay of game penalty was unforgivable. Like, just because his kicker got him off the hook with the longest kick in SEC history, which that is a league that's been around for a long time, uh, that does not mean that Elijah Drinkwitz won that game. His team won him that game. Uh, he does not deserve that. But I wanted to mention that. That was, you know, a possible error there. And just something that he made the kick, so it doesn't matter ultimately. But if he had missed it, it probably would have mattered. And it's a mistake that you can't make in that moment, especially coming off of a timeout. Like, you just called a timeout to ice the kicker. Somebody's got to be aware of that where you're thinking, okay, well, Willie is out there and we're sending Philip Brooks back there to possibly return this. Uh, somebody has to be on that. Somebody. I don't care if you're making $5 an hour or if you're, you know, if you're Chris Kleiman. One of you has to be aware of that. And uh, fortunately, I guess in some way, I say fortunately, it didn't end up costing you because that might have been an even worse way to lose than a 61 yarder where you, you felt like you might be able to force overtime and sneak out of there with a win. But all right, enough with that. Moving on. Some people brought this up after the game. I think this is something that is a, kind of a common occurrence for this staff, but there seemed to be a, a lack of concern or urgency after losing the game the way they did yesterday. Chris Kleiman came in there, just basically did the whole, hey, we're going to be fine, blah, blah, blah. That's a good football team. It was a good game. A uh, couple of things, and I'm side with people that have said this. I don't really think yesterday was a good game. It was a close game, but K-State didn't play well. Missouri, you know, they they had points to book in the game that looked good, but the middle part was terrible. Um, and I don't know how good of a team Missouri is. I think they're a team that, that wants to beat themselves. K-State just didn't put them in a position to beat themselves yesterday and take advantage of it. Um, but and I'll start with Fan here. He's, uh, he's the coach of the group. So do you find that the lack of concern, urgency, you know, how bothered they might be by this loss? Uh, you know, concerning it all, or does that bother you, or, or where do you stand on this? No, it doesn't bother me one bit. I, coaches are going to be coaches in the media, and Kleiman has been this way. He's not – he never gets too high, he never gets too low, um, and I don't mind that. I think that's just his M.O. I think he also firmly believes, and, and he said multiple times, who – tough opponents on the road – you want to get to the fourth quarter with a chance to win. I think he probably firmly believes, even though they didn't play well, they still were in that opportunity. You get to the fourth quarter with a chance to win. And I'm sure he believes Missouri is a very tough opponent. So I think he was measured. I think behind the scenes it's probably going to be a little more harsh, especially with his offense and some of the defensive mistakes. <clears throat> but he's not going to air that stuff out in the media. And I don't I don't care that he does. I mean, I, I think it's honestly – probably because I do coach. I think it's silly that people get upset that he's not like railing on his team in the media. I don't think it's necessary. I don't need you to think you need to do that with college kids or even pro kids. I don't think kids respond to that anymore. I don't, I don't, I just don't think it's necessary at all. So I, I have no problem with anything that was said in the media by him or the players. Cause I think the players take on the persona of the coaches behind the scenes. It's going to be a different deal. I, I, I it probably just is, but they're not going to air that out loud. So I don't care. Drew? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I would be more concerned if Coach Kleiman was airing it out and showing upset and frustration to the media because that's just not his personality. It's not what he does. It's not his M.O. He's never done it. I mean, the most frustrating loss probably of the Kleiman era was the Texas game in 2021, and he didn't air his frustrations out then. So if he didn't do it then I just don't see him ever doing it. So honestly, like I, I would genuinely probably be more concerned if he did, because that, then that's just not his personality. Yeah, I mean you're you're right. In the 2021 game, he could have gone out there and uh, he could have blamed an, the adult in the in the room. I mean that was that was Courtney Messingham's fault. He could have just thrown a, a 50 year old man under the bus and probably warranted there. Uh, but he didn't. And, and he really did because he fired him. A yeah, that's true. Later. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. He, he he did it behind the scenes, which is yep. what he's gonna do. Yeah, I mean I, I think that there I think that there are times where um you know I, I think you have to as a as a division one football coach that is going to be in this position where you have to talk about this, I think you have to strike the right balance where I don't think that he needs to be going out and, and ripping guys, even though 
And again, man, I feel bad about this, and and people are probably like, well, you're saying it, so you don't. But like, I wouldn't have been opposed if the offensive line had a tongue lashing publicly. Like, I that is that is where the problem is right now on the offense, and that needs to be identified. Um, but he's not going to do that. I don't think he's going to immediately just throw his players out under there. But I do think that you have to to find the right moment to to kind of say, hey, look. It sucks. We did not. We should not have lost that game. Or you have to give some kind of words of of you know understanding of where your fan base might be at. Because at the end of the day, the reason why Chris Kleiman is in this job and why he he makes the money he does is because there's a fan base that cares about this. And I you know as we know, coaches have to do a lot of things they don't like in college football, but it's in the name of playing the game. And I think. A lot of college football coaches could get better at this, that if you just played the game a little bit better afterwards, and I know it's tough to do after a loss, you just kind of revert back to the kind of person that you are. And obviously, Chris Kleiman is a guy that he has seen a lot of football. He understands like, hey, we're, we're going to be okay. We can do this. And so he's he's not going to, to go this way. But I think you need to have some awareness just to, to show that you have some of the same feelings that your fan base has and that you're aware that there are problems, that the team is aware of that. Um, cause obviously it will get people in a tizzy. It will, it will rub some the wrong way that there just doesn't seem to be as much of a, a care and concern about that kind of loss. And at the end of the day, like, I mean, it, it sucks for them, but it doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Cause now you have the nine most important games on your schedule coming up. And this is a team that lost a non-conference game last year and it did not matter for them. And so, they know how that's going to play out, and they're they're going to be okay from it. Um, it's just about actually going and putting into practice what you've learned from the this loss and, and the poor performances in the first two weeks of the season as well, and and going from there. But um, I, I I side with you guys on it. I just think that there probably is a little bit of got to play the game as a coach, give a little bit uh, to to the fan base, and show the frustration a little bit better. Um, I certainly did not need him going in there and saying that, you know, the it was a good football game. I did not think it was a good football game. Um, I, and I think I think that bothers people too when you lose a game and then you're the one to say that was a good football game. Like, eh, you know, I that's probably the one thing that I would pull out of what I would say if I was Chris Kleiman. Like, uh, I would say any game I lose is a bad football game. That's how I would look at it. But you know, I'm not coaching. And I've not been in a position to win or lose a game in a long time, so I, I'll, 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 you know, say that just to to make it clear. But that's one of those things that in coach speak world I don't necessarily enjoy. It's like, eh, you did lose. That probably should not be considered good in any realm in your book, but whatever. Uh, I'll throw in here that like, yes, like you can't see like how much that they truly care with how climate is in the media after losses, but I will say that you can tell how much they care because the next week they almost always play their best game. Like if you look at last year, the loss to Tulane, they came back and probably played their best game when they played at Oklahoma. And then when they lost to Texas, you know, they turned around and had one of their best games at Baylor. And the loss to TCU, they smoked Oklahoma State. Yep. Yeah, so you can tell how much the loss – cares and like sticks with them with how they play the next week okay well ucf watch out you might as well just roll over now the cats are coming any any final thoughts on on that fan i'll let you get the last word in here if you know you thought i was out of line no i don't, I don't think you're out of line i just i just think it's a dangerous game for a coach to overreact uh either way to a win or a loss and i think Kleiman does that to a T and he's always going to do that to a T kind of like Drew said, I mean, that's his MO. Um, I think the, and I think, like I said, I think the players uh, take that on, but I do think it'll be interesting to see how they do this week. Cause they have always responded well, especially last year after losses. I, and I thought, you know, even, even Will Howard, you know, some people said he didn't, cause at first I think he kind of held back. Cause at first he talked about how upset everybody was. And then he kind of came back and said, everything's fixable etc which i think is you know the the persona of coach beat coming back but to me the way he he started that conversation by saying how mad everybody was really spoke to where those guys probably are at all right real quick uh, we'll get to a, a bigger point in a second but this is something that came to me 
again, I hate, you know, I'm, I'm not, I hate to do this because the very first thing that I learned when I started doing stuff like this, the, the little, little Mason Voth broadcasting history for you. The first, uh, the first, like, eh, I guess it was the second year I was doing it. I was a junior in high school. I was calling, you know, Bueller high school basketball and it was girls and boys, both games. And Bueller started the season in Heston and there was a, a certain player that uh, was clearly not at the, the caliber of the other players on the team. And they struggled mightily in the game and uh, were a, a, a cause. And I came in on Monday and my, my teacher, Coach Torgerson, also my golf coach, said to me, hey, look, got a lot of good feedback, but there were some people that thought you were a little too harsh on this person. And so I, I try to be mindful of it if it's you know something that I'm closely connected to or something that I, you know, understand a little bit more. And I'll like, I'll always be harsh on Dorkwitz. That's fine. I'll do that. I'll, I'll even do it after his win yesterday. Again, he did not win that game. His team did. But I, I I say that because I'm going to bring up the offensive line again. And I feel like I've probably been a little, little harsh on them. I feel like I was harsh on them last year at times because there are times where, and I'm not going to name names here, but I think that there are some of the guys on the offensive line that warrant the hype and the love and all, you know, the, the beef and the NIL and all that stuff. And I also think that there are other guys on there that their talent is not matching the level of hype and expectations and everything else that comes with it. And those guys might be the ones that reap the benefits a little bit more. The offensive line is clearly the problem right now, offensively. Am, am I out of line for saying that on the offense? Is that where most of the issues start here? I mean, maybe we could say Will Howard has a few things here. Maybe the pass catchers are a little off, but, the run game can't get going because of the offensive line. You're having to jostle Cooper Beebe around. I mean, Cooper Beebe gave up a sack for the first time in however long yesterday, and I think it's solely because he had a move to, to right tackle after playing left guard all this time, and you keep moving a guy back and forth. He's having to carry the entire burden of this team. I think I don't know if it was Drew or D.Y. that said it to me in the booth, but they said you, you kind of wonder, like, was that an element of he's trying to make up for somebody else's mistake too? And so – it, to me, it, it's clearly the problem. I'll let you guys tell me if, if I'm wrong right now in saying that the offensive line is the, the majority shareholder in the problems on the offense. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. All right, so sure. inside of that, and I'll, I'll default to Fan on this again because he's a coach, at, inside the locker room and, and at practice and, and you know privately as a team, how do you handle something like that where you have a, a glaring hole, especially when it's at like a position group, you know, I think sometimes it's a little different. Like when Will Howard was out there the first two years and he was clearly the problem for the offense. Like that's, I think that's fair to say. And I think Will Howard would even say that he was the problem the first two years he had to be thrown out there. And I think it's a little different if you're, you know, you're, you're continuously going after that guy, but this is a group. This is, this is a team within a team and that team needs to, to pick things up. So how do you handle addressing that situation? If you're Chris Kleiman and Connor Riley, because, there needs to be some some more weight being pulled in that department. I, I think it you handle it in that position group because if you, I'm sure uh, Riley and Kleiman are talking constantly about what they need to do, how they can fix it, and Klein is involved in that conversation as well. Um, <clears throat> but if you get units pointing fingers at each other on your team or defense pointing fingers at the offense, uh, you're going to have major problems, much bigger problems than just one unit. So uh, you you got to, as everybody else has to be picking those guys up, but inside the locker room, but in, in that unit group and in their meetings and when they're watching film, I guarantee you there are guys getting railed on and <clears throat> getting critiqued when they're doing things wrong and pointed out when they're doing things right, they're getting graded, all that stuff is happening. So uh, I, I trust that that is going on, um, and that's just one where you, you got to trust the coaching staff to take care of that inside. But you certainly don't want divisions to start in your locker room because when that happens, you're in you're in big big trouble, and uh, that that's a big picture thing you do not want to happen. Drew, uh, in, in, oh, well, I'll, I'll promise this is the last time we talk about the offensive line today. I'll quit being mean to those guys. So. Uh, Drew, any 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 thoughts on the the O line situation and, and how maybe it it should be handled? Or I mean, I'll, I'll let you approach this from a different side. Like I brought up the BB thing and just yanking him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
I mean, is is that something that K State probably needs to get a handle on and just decide like we got to roll with one deficiency in one area, and it's it's better for us to leave Cooper Beebe, our best offensive lineman, probably one of, if not the best offensive lineman in the country at one position and let him do his thing. And we're just at, you know, the mercy of whatever ha- happens around him. Yeah. I, I think that we're at the point now with, you're getting closer with Christian Duffy coming back. John Pastore should be closer to being back next week as well. That I, I think that if they're both at least limited, that the hope would be that you can split the reps pretty evenly between Duffy and Pastore and keep BB at left guard. Because I, I just feel like if you want to get the run game going again, you have to keep BB on the interior. But it, it's so hard because the pass protection on the right side has, has been poor when BB hasn't been a right tackle. So it, it's hard. But I think in an ideal world, you could maybe split the reps between Pastore and uh, Duffy next week. And then just keep BB at left guard full time because it, it, it's so hard switching between positions and especially on opposite sides of the offensive line that I feel like he was just it, the sack that he gave up yesterday was just kind of a product of I've been moving around. I feel like you I, I mean, we know because we've talked about it so much. That, that they probably feel a lot of pressure right now. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they are, they're human. They see what everybody says. They, they'll probably hear what we have to say too. Yeah. That they, they probably feel the pressure. And I, I feel like a little bit of it, at least with BB sack giving up yesterday, probably had to deal with some of the pressure that they've all felt. Yeah. Uh, real quick. You, do you guys want to venture to guess who had the, uh, you know, again, I, I I, pre- I want to say like I know pro football focus is not the gospel. They do a lot of things that it's just like head scratching. You know eh, that doesn't seem seem right or anything. But I do think it's a good reference and it, it can kind of give you some insight. Anyone want to guess who they graded as the highest offensive player for K State yesterday? Ooh, that's a good that's a good question. Um, Gillum. I'll, I'll go Treshawn Ward. All right. So Hayden Gillum third yesterday. Hmm. Um, Cooper Beebe was second. It was Will Howard, number Will one. Howard. Hmm. And it's not just that he was the best on a team that wasn't very good because uh, Cooper Beebe was the only other person with Will Howard that got an offensive grade over 70. And then Hayden hmm. Gillum was 69.1. Jaden Jackson was fourth. KT Leviston was fifth. That that rounds things out. Uh Will Howard got an 84.9 yesterday and an 85.8 in terms of passing. The thing that brought him down was he had a 57 run grade, which he was hurt. So, yeah. I mean, a little, little tough there. To me, that's one of those deals where, yes, we can, we can talk about how PFF hates Patrick Mahomes for some reason and they have some really silly things. That's a very telling thing of, of just the kind of situation that Will Howard was in yesterday that – the people that are watching this and that are much smarter at football than I think at least Drew and I, I mean, fam, fans probably smarter than us and uh, probably rivals that level, but that they watched that game and they said, you know, Will Howard pr- played a really, really, really good game given the circumstances. And I think that's something that probably shouldn't be lost in it because I, I do think that there's, you know, some, some distaste towards Will right now. And it's probably not fully warranted given the fact that, yeah, he was banged up yesterday and, He's also dealing with with what's in front of him. So I, I just something to to make note of that I, I I just saw that kind of fascinated me. Even the interception that he threw yesterday wasn't his fault. Like the throw was bad, but it was the correct read. He threw it right into the blitzer, and Ward was wide open. He just overthrew him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll uh we'll move on real quick. Um, this is this is something that I I, I mentioned yesterday. You know, K State. We feel like through three games. What's the, what's the best game they've brought? Like you have an A game, a B game, a C game. What is the best grade of game that they've they've brought so far? I would I would say B just because of <clears throat> the thing we've talked about constantly is the offensive line being where it's at. Um, I think the defense probably has played as well as they can 
even though they struggled in this game for a couple periods um, overall this season. I think I think we expect more from the offense, and uh, I think they were the the biggest letdown for me in the loss yesterday and overall this season. The, we've t- talked about periods of struggles in the run game in every game, mm-hmm. and I think we had that again yesterday. So that, I, that would be my grade so far. Yeah, I, I'd say that they've probably played a B game against both Simo and Troy. And then probably like a C, maybe even C minus yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I p- people were killing me on my grades last week when I gave the offensive line a C plus, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of on a curve. And I said a C plus game against Troy is likely a you know a D game against Texas. Well, Missouri also had a pretty good defensive front, and and we kind of saw the the outcome of that yesterday. And I I think. We talk about this like, yeah, K-State hasn't played their best. They haven't played their best. At what stage, though, do we get to, you know, game five, game six, where K-State has not played what we think is considered their best, and we just have to admit this is what K-State is right now. This is the team they are as opposed to a team that's struggling in some areas that can get better. I, I think until Christian Duffy is back and healthy um, and we really see him play, you know, 50, 60 snaps in a game, <clears throat> to me – he is that big of a loss. I think he's – I think I said it last year. Duffy's – last week, Duffy's a bigger loss than I expected him to be. I thought other guys would be able to step up and play, especially with experience we have even in our depth. And that just simply hasn't been the case. So when we get Christian Duffy back, that that will be who we are, I think, as an offense, and we can really say that. But uh, that's the tough part is – losing him and, and even Pastor, may, maybe, you know, he's that big of a deal. Maybe we've, we're missing two of our top five offensive yeah. linemen or two of our top six, and we don't even know it. And we're definitely missing one of our top three or four. So I think that's a big deal to think about too. Yeah, honestly, that that's a, that's a really good question. And it's a tough question because you look at the schedule coming up and you probably don't need necessarily your – a a minus game next week with UCF on a backup quarterback. You maybe don't need your A game with Oklahoma State being a disaster. So like you could be five and one after your first six games and still or four and one after your first five games and still not play your best game yet. So it, it, it's tough because of who they have coming up and what that other teams have. Because I, I feel like if they keep winning you're like, okay, yeah, they played their B game and still won. But at, at some point, it is who you are. But you're kind of also, like you said, you're kind of like grading it on a curve because of the opponent in front of you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's tough. Like, you know, it's tough to accurately assess things when you beat CMO 45 nothing. That's no different than any of those FCS games that Chris Kleiman has coached at K-State. Like, they've, they've beat them all, no matter the team that they've had. Troy, they beat him 42 to 13. That's one of the better stompings of a group of five opponent that they've had uh, under Chris Kleiman. I think the only other one that would, would be better than that was his first year when they, they stomped Bowling Green, who was probably like an FCS opponent at that point in time. It's, it's tougher to do that. And so, I mean, it, w- winning masks a lot of flaws, as we all know in, in sports, because you keep doing it and you're like, hey, okay, things are, things are looking good here. But underneath all that, like there are a lot of problems still going in. And We'll we'll have to see. I mean, you're right. UCF. I think it's I think it's going to be a tougher game than what people think. Even with Plumlee out, I, I mean, I think UCF deserves more credit than just being a team that has an, an SEC transfer at quarterback. Um, obviously, Gus Malzahn is a is a very good football coach, and they they have some legit talent there. Oklahoma State. That's one of those. I mean, it's a road game. It's a Friday night, so maybe a weird scenario, but. They just got beat at home last night by South South Alabama and didn't look competitive really in that game. They're still trying to play three quarterbacks. I mean, if you have two quarterbacks, that means you don't have one. If you have three quarterbacks, do you have negative one? Like that's that's kind of where I'm at right now with the, the Cowboys situation. So really, I think it's about getting healthier, getting in a situation where you feel good, and maybe they go out and they do play what we can say against power five opponents, no matter who it is and what their situation is. You play a B game and then you get ready and you have that game against Texas Tech on the road. I think that as long as, like fans said, Christian Duffy's back at this point, at that point, that road game in Lubbock is going to be probably very telling of what this team is. And that they might have some room to, you know, you know, 
sometimes in, in class you can redo an assignment or something. You might get a redo of that if you lose the tech because then you get TCU and Houston at home, and then it's on the road in Austin. And, and all can be forgiven and made up for if you win that game. So, like, this is still a team that with the nature of the Big 12 and how bad it's been, like, I, I think perspective needs to be kept there on where everything is. And, not, you know, I'll, I'll transition us then into a college football outsider here, and we'll talk about some other games outside of K-State and Mizzou yesterday. I would love nothing more than to do that because I'm I hate talking about that. Um but the Big 12 looked terrible yesterday. Like, it was another bad weekend for the Big 12. They kind of tried to redeem it last weekend, and they are in the same group of – there are some other Power 5 conferences not having a good go of things. I mean, the SEC is probably right there with the Big 12 as the two Power 5 leagues with the worst non-cons so far. And you go and you look through at what took place in the Big 12 yesterday, more bad losses for teams and games that were far too close than what they should have been. I mean – Texas is one of them. Wyoming was with them for a long time, and I know Texas eventually pulled away, but that's not a great thing like that. And, oh, and Alabama, I, out, offside of that, Alabama looked bad yesterday against South Alabama or South South Florida, not South Alabama, maybe no state. But like that's one of those deals where there are kind of layers to this. Like, how much did that Texas win at Bama actually mean, and how much is that worth for? And then, you know, Wyoming comes in and, and, and plays them tough for a little bit. So Texas is not as good as we thought they were after last week. Um, they're probably a lot, lot like the team that I thought they were at the start of the season, like any Texas team. They are, have a ton of talent. They can do a lot of great things, but they're going to be kind of stupid at times, and, and we've seen that. And then you go through, um, I mean, KU should, should have blown out Nevada. Nevada is terrible, and that's an awesome KU offense. They only scored 31 points. Um, they were, the line was, they were favored by 27 and a half. So they barely scored what they were supposed to cover by. They went 31 to 24 against the Nevada team that like started their season 66 to 14 against USC and 33 to six lost to Idaho, an FCS school. So KU was a little bit different than anticipated yesterday. Oklahoma state got blown out at home 33 to seven. Cincinnati, who I thought was actually performing above expectations, they lose at home to Miami in overtime yesterday and not the Hurricanes. Uh, that would be the Red Hawks. And then Iowa State, I mean, they lost 10-7 on the road at Ohio. Matt Campbell's getting, you know, chirped after the game by fans, and he's turning around and have to be held back by his players and coaches because uh, he's going to go lose it on a guy that just said, uh, "Your Campbell's on the hot seat, like, you got to take that as a coach. I mean, you just lost at a Mac opponent at Iowa State. You got to you got to own that. So bad day in the Big Twelve all around yesterday, uh, except for BYU. <laughs> BYU saved the league's mm -hmm. bacon by picking up a win that I did not think they were capable of doing. So let's you know, well, I'll, I say all that to kind of set the stage to keep perspective of. I think K State as they are playing right now is still a top three team in the Big Twelve. I think it is still going to come down to them, Texas, and Oklahoma. And that that it, Texas has the leg up on those three teams because they get to control their own destiny truly. They play both of those teams this year. K-State and Oklahoma do not play each other. So you were at the mercy of getting help from others. But you take what we know and saw yesterday and what K-State has on their schedule, and it kind of starts to change the math on a lot of this. The, the road game at Oklahoma State – they might be the worst team in the Big 12 right now. They they very easily could be. It's either them or Houston, I think. But Houston showed a little bit of fight against TCU yesterday. Uh, Houston is not very good, though. Baylor, uh, I mean, they struggle a little bit early with Long Island. I think they ended up winning 30-7, to weather delay, whatever. But Baylor's not been good this year. And then Iowa State is not good either. That's apparent. It's clear now. And while Kansas is good and can surprise you and everything, and I still think that KU is probably, you know, the somewhere in the top six of the league right now. That is a team that is clearly not performing to a certain level that might be expected of them. I think the Illinois game was a little bit of fool's gold. There were some odd things that took place there. Um, and I, I very easily could be the worst game Illinois plays all year. And Illinois is not a good football team right now. But Illinois did a lot of bad things at the two spots that they're really good at, defensive and offensive line. So I'll hand it off to you guys. Uh, you can give thoughts on where K-State stands in the Big 12 and keeping perspective there or uh, anything from the league or outside of that, that that caught your attention yesterday. 
Yeah, in the scope of things, K State losing on a last second field goal on the road to an SEC team compared to the rest of the league uh, is, is not a dramatic, drastic, awful loss. You know, OU did their thing where they beat a bad team badly, yeah. which, which Venables is good at, but when he gets competitive games, he's not as good. Um, but you, I mean, you pointed out some of the bad Iowa State, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State, uh, Houston. Um, there are some, um, it's looking like the bottom of the Big 12, and maybe this is to be expected with the new teams coming in. Generally, we've always said, and we say this in basketball more often, the bottom is what has kept the Big 12 strong. Is Maybe we don't have the elite team or two, but usually the bottom is not awful. And I think we may have an awful bottom this year with three or four teams that are really, really bad uh, that teams can beat up on, which you know is helpful to a season where you you have a game or two where you know you you cannot play your best and still get a win and not that you're resting but you kind of do get that opportunity where you know sometimes we don't have that in the big 12 or we haven't in the past so that's going to be a factor you know texas was unimpressive like you said but you know and it looks less impressive their alabama win which you which you mentioned um you know ucf dominated the top 25 FCS team in Villanova. So Villanova wasn't awful, and, and UCF put them away early. Um, Texas Tech got their first win, but I think Tarleton State's a pretty bad team. So, yeah. And then Pitt, West Virginia, the backyard brawl. West Virginia does get the dub, but, man, I think that was just two bad football teams playing. Um, so yeah. it's a mixed league. I was surprised KU did not blow out um, Nevada. Nevada is not very good. Maybe the worst, one of the worst teams in FBS right now. So. Um, that was unimpressive. So it is looking like the league maybe is is third, fourth, fifth in the pecking order this year instead of first or second. And real quick, Pitt, that has to be a miserable existence if you're a Pitt fan right now. You just lost to two teams that are probably going to finish in the bottom third of the Big 12 in back-to-back weeks. The, the losses to Cincinnati and West Virginia cannot feel good right now. Oh, no. I mean, I, I was even going to bring up Pitt in, in mine. That was my biggest takeaway because I, I watched a little bit of that game, but I, I couldn't get past how bad Pitt's offense was. Um, I, I've said it, I think, every week that we've done this show. Oklahoma State's got to figure something out at quarterback that you can't play three and you can't have two completely different offenses with the quarterbacks. Like Alan Bowman comes in and just chucks it all over the yard. I think in his in his first two drives they threw it nine times and only threw it one or only ran once, and then the other two quarterbacks like it's a more balanced offense. Like you, you got to figure something out there, and, and looking uncompetitive against South Alabama, and then uh, BYU best win of the league. That might be the best win in the league all non conference season. Mm -hmm. Going to Arkansas and and winning like that, especially with how bad BYU played early. Arkansas was up 14 nothing in the first four minutes. And then BYU got off the mat in the one. I actually fell asleep uh, during the KU-Nevada game. I saw that it was tied when I fell asleep. And I, I was like, what? Like, KU just didn't look inspired or honestly really that impressive last night compared to how they looked last Friday night. And that, that kind of makes you wonder, like, it's going to be an interesting week in the league with conference play starting. That BYU KU game, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. very very interesting now because before before this week, you I would have listened to you say I would have listened and agreed to you saying like KU is probably going to roll BYU. Yeah, I thought KU was going to win by three scores. I, that was a win that I gave KU just instantly the second the schedule came out. But but now it's like what, what I don't know what's going to happen. That's a very intriguing game. I think KCUCF is still going to be a very intriguing game next week. And it's just going to be a weird year in the league because there's so many bad teams at the bottom. So here, here's uh, one thing, and this is something that, I mean, again, I was boots on the ground in Lawrence last week doing investigative journalism, trying to figure out what's real, what's not about the Jayhawks. And the one thing is Illinois did not run the ball enough. I thought KU was going to be susceptible to the run. Um, I mean, Nevada put up 145 yards on the ground rushing yesterday against KU. And again, that's a team that is not very good, Nevada. Um, so that's exposable, which is like you think about matchups with K-State. 
if you can face a team that is not very good at defending the run, and that's been one of your weaknesses is running the ball offensively, might be a game that sets up well for K-State. And so that's disappointing there. Um, but, Drew, I liked what you said about Oklahoma State. It's one of those deals now where I think if you're Mike Gundy, you just have to pick one and stick with it. Like, they, all three of them suck. Like, no no three of those guys is going to be a good college quarterback ever. <coughs> um, uh, real quick, yesterday the uh, the QBRs of the three quarterbacks in Oklahoma State's 33-7 loss to South Alabama. Gunnar Gundy was, was the best, 21.6. <laughs> Alan Bowman, 2.3. Garrett Rangel, 3.1. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that was the quarterback play yesterday. Uh, Gunnar Gundy was 9 of 18 for 64 yards. Alan Bowman was 6 of 12 for 42 yards and a pick. Garrett Rangel was 1 of 5 for 8 yards. And, uh, Why are you going to put Rangel in 1 of, one of 5, 8 yards? It makes no sense. Uh, on the season... Uh, Oklahoma State is averaging 6.8 points per quarterback played in the, in every game. And that <laughs> is that is factoring in that they scored uh, nine points per quarterback in the first two games of the season. So the, yesterday really tanked the average on them. Uh, but they're they are not very good. And, you know, I that, I said to D.Y. yesterday, I was like, yeah, the, you know, the Oklahoma State game, like they're not very good. He said, well, but road game at Oklahoma State. I get it, but. That's that's a bad team that K State should be able to handle, and and that's why I mean right now UCF is you, you get past UCF, you get the bye week, then you're at Oklahoma State, like that's a big deal. So I'll I'll shift into this then, and uh, we'll we'll end this with our our one question for next week. So Drew, what is the one question that you either have that you want Chris Kleiman to answer on Tuesday, or that the team needs to go out and answer on Saturday? I'll kind of go with uh, a little off the beaten path, maybe. Uh, mine is, does Will Howard play? He he was really, really banged up at the end of the game last, last or yesterday morning. And um, even in the post game, you could just tell he wasn't walking well. He wasn't really walking like a guy that might play next week. It, and it it's not necessarily like the worst thing for him to not play next week because you're already playing a team that's on their backup quarterback too. So it's it's interesting to really see because I feel like with a leg injury, especially, it could really tighten up, and maybe he doesn't practice this week. So I, it's something to keep in mind that it's it's not a given that Will Howard is going to start. I mean, it's it's certainly something to think about, and you know, I I like uh, the K State backup quarterback situation with Avery Johnson better than UCF's backup situation. Uh, a guy that wasn't very good at South Florida fan. What's your question for the week? I, I think we've, <clears throat> I just go back to, we've got to figure out the, the offensive line, AKA running game um, and more efficiency, um, more consistency uh, and being able to run the football with our running backs, especially whether it's zone or whether it's power stuff. Um, it looked like yesterday we tried a lot more zone, run game and didn't pull people very much. Um, it's hard, harder to see on TV than when you're there live. But um, I I just – that's the big question with this team is is can we run the ball consistently enough to, to really – I think that's going to be what opens up this offense. You know, I think you – Mason, you said it well. I think the receivers have been better than we thought. Jaden Jackson has stepped up. Um, Brooks has been what we thought. Uh, Senate has been good, you know, even with a couple drops, he still had a very good game. Um, RJ Garcia may be a little disappointing. Keegan Johnson, I don't think we know what we have yet because of the injury. So, but until that running game becomes a consistent strength for this team, I think we're going to struggle uh, to be the offense we think this team can be and the strength of the team. And uh, we got to get that figured out. And that's that's going to be the big factor to me against UCF, who I don't think has a great defense there in. 43rd in the F plus coming into yesterday's game, although they, they played well against uh, a, a FCS team, which won't count in the F plus ranking. So this is going to be a, a opportunity for the, hopefully this running game to get going. My, I'll, I'll go to the, to the other side of the ball for my question. I think both of those are, are great. Those are probably the two biggest. I think obviously for a lot of reasons, the, you know, is will going to be able to go is going to be 
fascinating for everybody because number one quarterback is always the most interesting position. And number two, it's a whole lot more interesting when the backup quarterback that would go if Will can't is Avery Johnson. Um, you know, the, I mean, again, I, I, sometimes I say it jokingly, but like, it's, it's legit how he is treated. He is, he is the golden boy. He is the chosen one. That is like, those are the expectations people has for him. I mean, the four star, one of the best quarterbacks in the country from in the state, like there are lofty expectations. People get excited for anything that has the Avery Johnson tag on it. So that's interesting, but I'll go defensively. And even though I think the defense has been really good and up front, they've been better than maybe expected. The one thing that I would like to see out of them next week, and I, I, I have questions about, is will we get a game from the defensive line, and you know the linebackers play a part in this too, where the pass rush is happening from the jump. Like it is happening at the start of the game because it feels like in all three games so far this year, it has eventually gotten going and they've made some plays. Like late second quarter into the third, like you know Drew and I mentioned earlier, they, they got to the quarterback. They got to Brady Cook. They, they made some things happen. But it's taken a while to get to that point. And there are enough talented guys up there that they need to start impacting the game early on. Because here we sit now through three games. K-State only has two turnovers for us this year. And one of them was in garbage time against Troy last week. You know, it, it counts, I guess. You know, Toby Austin Somni got in there. He got the sack and the forced fumble and Uso fell on it, all that, whatever. But really, you only have one turnover forced in the heat of the battle. And that's an area where K-State was really good last year. They they were like second in the league in picks. They were able to force some fumbles. And to do all of that, a lot of times the easiest way to force a fumble is to hit a quarterback that is not expecting it or to get in his face and immediately apply pressure and force him into throwing a bad ball. Like Brendan Mott was really good at that last year, getting good pressure that forced some bad balls. Um, I think he was the one that got the pressure that forced Duggan to, to float the one to Julius Brents in the Big 12 title game and throw some other bad passes that just weren't catchable. The defensive line and the defense as a whole needs to get to the quarterback the second the opposing team hits the field for offense, not when we get to you know the, the 445 mark of the second quarter. And that's my question is if we see that happen. So that will, uh, that will do it for us. We will get out of here just over an hour. Let everybody get on with their day. DY and I will be back tomorrow for a quick Monday show, um, and we'll see if if the the mood is any better for either of us and everybody. Um, certainly, hope that it's a, a good week and at least uh, you know K State will be back in Manhattan this weekend. It'll be taking on UCF seven o'clock the kick time against the Knights. So for Drew, for Fan, I'm Mason. You've been watching K State Online. Make sure that you're subscribed to the YouTube and the podcast platforms as well as being joined over at K-State Online as part of On3. be a, a great thing. If you're not, you're consuming this content, you want more of it. Stuff we have here is good. The stuff that Drew and DY can do when it comes to writing and covering the team daily and instantly, it's much better than anything that's going to happen here. And, of course, you get to be a part of the uh, all the meltdowns on the message boards too. So uh, go make sure that you're a part of K-State Online over at On3. And uh, this crew will be back a week from today recapping the UCF game and then D1I with content all week long.